Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Uh, today, I am joined by writer, producer, director, Elsie Holt. Elsie, how you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you, Ken? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for asking. Um, so for those of you that don't know, Elsie is all over the place. Uh, been an actor in Your Next, VHS2, uh, writer, actor, producer of the upcoming Time's Up actor in the upcoming On Location, as well as he's written a book, uh, Grim Grim War, which is a collection of short horror stories. You can check that out down here in the description. I got all of Elsie's links down here, so make sure you're checking it out, showing him some love. Um, so how's things been going for you, man? I know quarantine's been kind of crazy, but how you been living? Uh, it's been it's been pretty busy, even in spite of 2020 being insane. Uh, I, just, I just did a movie called Butcher's Bluff, which I shot in August. Then I shot on location and then, and now we're about to go into principal photography. We're in pre-production now of Time's Up, which I see you're sporting the shirt, Pine Falls High School. Yeah, I love, I love it. Uh, yeah, so it's been really busy, uh, surprisingly, uh, even though 2020, like I said, has been just insane for everybody. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's been pretty productive uh, for me, but, you know, things are different on sets of movies now with COVID. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to take a lot of safety precautions and it's important, essential, but it doesn't mean everything has, has shut down. You know, things are moving, uh, th things are moving forward in the film world and distribution's gotten a little odd, as you can tell, even with large movies, you know, you have things like, you know, Tenet and things like that that were like experiments to see if people were gonna go back to the theater uh, and we're still yeah. kind of figuring that out, I think. And it's one of those things where, especially right now, I think it's super important to support the indie filmmakers and um, all you guys that are doing indie films, because like you said, you don't have a $30 million budget to go out there and do what you guys are doing. And yet you're still in this age of a lot of DIY, you're doing it for the fans because you know, you have a good story, you know, you have a good cast and crew and you want to get it out there to us. And we appreciate it. So everybody out there, make sure you're supporting all your indie filmmakers. It's something very important to all of us. Uh, where would we be without you guys, especially right now during quarantine and COVID and you know, the last, you know, what, six months, all the, I've watched everything on prime sugar, Hulu and Netflix and always waiting for new stuff to come out, man. So I'm very excited about time's up. Very excited about on location. I can't wait to see what you guys got in store for us. Um, you got anything else you're working on here in the future that you can talk about yet? Or um, There's a couple other films that as an actor that I'm not, I don't know that I can really talk about yet because the ink's okay. not dry. Uh, but certainly some things coming up as an actor. I'm work, I'm always working as an author because I, I, I'm kind of like a shark, you know, if I stand still, I die. So I, I'm always... <laughs> working on things which is why you know people say that i'm prolific and all these things but it's not prolific it's just uh, an obsession basically <laughs> which is why i do all the stuff that i do um I'd like I th i'm hoping to have another book out um next year a uh, novel this time grim grim war was a collection of short stories and of course time's up which i wrote the script for i'm um, co-producing along with damien maffey of uh, Haunt and Strangers fame, who is co-starring mm -hmm. in it with me. And it's being directed by Corey Norman, who are all people I believe you've talked to before. Yes, sir. Yeah. And it's been such an honor to have all of you on. Yeah, I'm meeting some of the coolest, most down-to-earth people while I'm doing this. And it's something that I wouldn't trade this for anything. You know, Damien, uh, one of the nicest dudes, Corey, all so down-to-earth, so willing to talk horror. And I'm very excited, you know, 5432 done. I'm so excited to see what you guys got in store for. Time's Up is something I'm extremely, extremely excited about. And for those of you who don't know, Time's Up is, is, a, is a whodunit slasher movie. I mean, it's very much a, a murder mystery with strong slasher elements set on New Year's Eve about a, a group of, of school teachers who are sort of trying to figure out, they're trying to recover from the somewhat publicized suicide of a student. And at a New Year's Eve party, they get this unexpected guest, which leads into the scavenger hunt from hell. And then, you know, the story is kind of off and rolling. I mean, the thing about the movie, Time's Up, is we really wanted it to be, uh, you know, when it hits the ground running and you go through and it's a, like a real hardcore slasher, 
extravaganza, but also with that whodunit element, which to me, writing wise, is what interested me the most. You know, I didn't don't know that I'm hugely interested in in simply writing like a slasher character in which you know you just watch how they how they die, how people die. But when you have that mystery element, that's that I thought was was kind of the the attractive part of the story for me. And it's it's something like I said, I've there he is. You know, very much excited. Everything I've heard, um, not just from you, but um, Hannah and Damien and Corey, the little things, obviously nothing spoilery, but the little details that I've been able to dig out of you guys, it's just, it's making me, I wish this was in my hands right now, you know? So you guys, this is something I really think uh, is going to be a lot of fun for the slasher genre, because like you said, it's not just your run of the mill slasher there is a lot more to it than just your run of the mill slasher that I can't, I don't want to spoil anything at all, but you guys are going to be really, really in for a really good treat when this finally is in our hands. Yeah. We want to make a kick-ass movie for people, you know, I mean, that's really what it's about entertaining people. Nobody wants to sit and sort of be bored, you know, but the film has, you know, thematic elements that are more than just what you would see in a normal horror movie. But at the same time, the key is to entertain the audience and to, and to give them the punch that they expect from this sort of from this sort of a movie, you know. And that's kind of the fun, exciting part um, in you know writing it and producing it. Every aspect of it, really, working with the effects people to make sure uh, Tom Devlin is doing the effects on this. He's a great effects guy, and he's going to provide some effects that I think are going to just going to be crazy i can't say what they are but it's like you know, right it's gonna be pretty nuts um did you guys ever get this uh split in half did you guys end up getting that with the indiegogo oh yeah oh yeah. yes i'm so happy yeah oh you're gonna see some bisection that's for sure yes um now i can't say who or how right right but you'll you'll definitely see some bisection action going on there which is kind of funny because the first film i and this is not an ode to myself i mean not that i'm above that but uh <laughs> the, the very first uh film i did uh which was a movie called homesick first film i did with adam wingard who is a, an old buddy of mine i've known adam since he was 19 and he directed went on to direct uh you know you're next and another movie i was in called pop skull and uh, now he's doing King Kong versus Godzilla. Um, but me and Adam, you know, we've known each other forever. And I did his first film called uh, Homesick, which co-starred Bill Mosley and the late, great Tommy Tolles. And uh, Tiffany Shepes was in it and a number of other people. And uh, I got bisected in that movie. So Beautiful. if you want to go out and see, uh, it's, you know, Synapse Films uh, distributed it, get a copy of, of the crazy, you know, I always think of, I don't know how many people have seen Homesick, but it's worth watching, especially if you're a fan of You're Next and you're a fan of Wingard's, you know, work, because you can see, you know, where we started out and where we started out was pretty intense. Um, and of course you get Bill Mosley, you get Tommy, you get all these yeah. people, you know. And we get to see you bisected, man. There's nothing we have, you know, I can't tell you how excited I got when that became something. Your perks are adding up to this. We're working for this. And it's something that, as horror fans, we all love that. You know, yeah. seeing that happen is just, that's, it's going to be monumental, man. I'm stoked. And that was the thing about the indie, you know, about the, uh, the Indiegogo campaign that we ran. We wanted to be transparent, but we also wanted to let you know kind of what we were planning and what we were doing, you know, without getting spoilery about it. Um, and yeah, I, and I, that's what I love about it. This like this open communication with the people who are going to contribute and to the fans of genre stuff in general, the stuff I've done, the stuff Damien has done, you know, and everyone else that's involved. Uh, I like that sort of interaction. You know, I don't yeah. get to do it as much as I would necessarily like to, especially now that, you know, conventions are, I'm, you know, I'm not really doing conventions at the moment. Sure. We'll see. We'll see how that goes in the future, but um, but they're still happening. So yeah. it's not as if well, you know. What once everything calms down and you do start doing cons again, I can't wait to come and meet you in person and shake your hand, man. Because I'm a big fan of everything you've done, and so having you on here is seriously, it's super huge for me. Everybody that you're next, I mean, alone. That's such a fantastic film, and 
it's one thing to be able to watch you on that film, not to sit and talk to you even before we started filming and just get to know you as Elsie, the man. And you're such a good dude. And I really appreciate you coming on and doing this as a fan. I, I appreciate it very much. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. You're next, man. What a, what, that's, that's the gift that keeps on giving people love you're next. And uh, yeah. I can understand why, you know, I think we managed to make a pretty uh, kick-ass movie there. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, that was really the film that uh, for me, you know, I remember standing on the set of that movie and, you know, I, like I said, I've known Adam since he, we were both young and, you know, we were literally making films in my grandmother's backyard at one point. And then, you know, we were standing on the set of this movie where we had a, a stunt woman about to jump through the window of a second story mansion into an airbag. And we had all this crew around. And, you know, I looked at Adam and I was like, did you ever think we would ever be here? And he, he said, you know, uh, I kind of hope so. <laughs> But uh, yeah, you have those moments. Uh, so, you know, Adam's success is, has, is just fantastic to me. I think it's, because I've never met a more talented dude, man. W Wingard is, he's the real deal. I, he, he's always been the real deal. And, you know, he's done a lot of movies that we haven't done together. But he did the Blair Witch uh, remake or sequel, sort of. Um, yeah, I'll say the one that just came out recently, right? Yeah. Uh, last, guess, last year, was it? Yes, yeah. Well, it's been a, a couple years, I think. Uh, was it? But, okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, he did The Guest, which is a great film with Dan Stevens. And Simon Barrett, who wrote and produced Your Next, also wrote both of those, The Blair Witch and The the, the Guest. So those are a couple to check out also. from one of your... Yeah, make sure you guys are checking those out. And like you said, and he's doing Godzilla vs. King Kong now. So, I mean, look at that. I mean, yeah. that is every horror fan's dream is to be a part of the monster universe that we grew up with, whether it's a universal monster with the Dracula, Frankenstein, Mummy, or Godzilla, King Kong, Mothra, that world as well. It's something that horror fans we grew up with, and he's living that dream now, man. So that's really cool. Good for him. Yeah, and it's been many years in the making. You know, a film of that size is like a five-year endeavor, basically. Yeah. You know, and so, but but uh, people shouldn't worry because it's not as if he's not ever, he's abandoned horror, you know. In fact, often he talks about how after this is over with, you know, we'll do, so, he wants to do something smaller and genre oriented. So, um, so yeah, he'll be back doing horror before you know. Good. But, Can't wait to see you guys working together again then, man. Hopefully make, yeah. it, make it lightning in a bottle twice with another You're Next. Hey, you know, I'm not a, I, I would love to do a sequel. Yeah. Uh, there were plans for a sequel back when we did the, the first one. And then, you know, we sort of all went off and did our own thing, but sure. um, you never know. We'd love to see it. I'll tell you that right now. The fans would love to see a your next too. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we've talked about what you have coming up in the future and the horror world. And we talked about some of the things you've done, but now I want to go back to the past and talk about how it started for you. The first horror movie that you ever watched that, what really sunk your teeth into the genre and your first horror movie was first horror movie I ever remember seeing was a nightmare on Elm street part three, the dream warriors. Uh, and funny <laughs> enough, this movie is one I've talked about the most on this. Is that and right? I, it blows me away how many people want to talk about this film, but I'm telling you, I will never be upset about it because this is one of my growing up and people have heard me say this on this podcast before. I can't tell you how many times I'd be playing a video game and like get to a boss level and beat a boss and be like, yeah, welcome to prime time, bitch. You know? <laughs> prime time, bitch. The kids. So I'm yeah. so excited to know that this movie was one of your first. Um, how old were you? Do you remember the first time you had seen it? I was, uh, it came out in 87. And so I was about six or seven years old. Yeah, I was a little young. Uh, I remember vividly, but the reason I, I, I say this movie when you ask that question is because the house we lived in, we had a little rec room off to the side. I have, even at that age, a very vivid recollection of standing in the back of the room and watching my brother, who is about 10, 11 years older than I am, and his girlfriend. My brother does not like horror. Like, he's not okay. a horror guy. You know, he's probably never seen any film I've, I've been in, right? Uh, <laughs> now, Army of Darkness loves it. Evil Dead 2 loves it. Evil Dead 1, too much for him, you know? Okay. Uh, so that's sort of his interest. Uh, Sci-fi and fantasy and stuff is more his thing. So she obviously made him watch this movie. 
And, you know, at that time, people didn't, we didn't have a VCR. She brought her own VCR and this had just come out on video cassette. And so she forced him to sit down and watch it. And I have a very vivid memory of standing there and watching this from across the room. Uh, And I can, it's like it was yesterday, you know? Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So that has to be the first one. And we're talking about how vivid your memory is. So I want to really tap into that. Which scene from this movie affected you the most? The scene I can remember from that day watching and reacting to was the one uh, with the marionette uh, where Freddie Mm -hmm. uses uh, the character's veins as marionette strings and bleeds him, you know, through the door where he just passes through the door. And then I really remember the tower where you had the wide shot and Freddie is up in the sky doing the the marionette and then cuts it and the character yeah. falls, you know, that, that is burned into my mind, that scene from and watching un- it that day. An underrated part of that whole scene is Joey. I mean, he's a mute, so he can't talk, but he's running through the halls and he's hitting with the lunch tray. And you just feel that anxiety without saying a word. Like that scene has always given me really bad anxiety. And something about this film, there's a couple different scenes in it that really give me bad anxiety. That's one of them. And the part where Freddie uses the drugs, you know, the heroin Mm. on the girl. That's another one that, you know, using... That's why, to me, the big three, the holy trinity of horror for me has always been Halloween, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street. And they've all been my favorite for different reasons. And Freddy, I think, has always been scariest because he will use your worst fears against you. Using, you know, the drug, something that she's worked so hard to be. And in the scene, she almost gives herself up to it at the end, knowing that she can't do it. And it's such a heartbreaking scene. And anybody that's battled any type of addiction, that's a really hard scene to watch. So... They to me, this is really where they perfected Freddy Krueger. Not so much a Nightmare on Elm Street, but Freddy Krueger was perfected in this movie because he's still dark, but he's also that jokey, funny one-liner. And we were talking a little bit ago about the prime time. Josh Eppard, the drummer from Coheed and Cambria, is a good friend of mine. Mm-hmm. And he's getting that maid, her head through the TV, and he's getting it hung on his wall. And I was like, that's so brilliant. I wish I would have thought of that. because That's the coolest thing in the world. Walk into somebody's rec room and just see the person's, you know, her head through the TV and her feet dangling down. I thought that was a great idea. Yeah, that was that's fantastic. I, yeah, I, I do agree with you. I think that that movie was the one that really first struck the balance correctly. You know, you had the early input of Wes Craven and Bruce Wagner, but then you also had, you know, Frank Darabont, who obviously is extraordinarily talented, as we later learned, uh, as a director and as a writer. And then you had Chuck Russell, you know, Mm -hmm. and somewhere in this mixture, you got the perfect balance between the horror and the fantasy because it does have those fantastical elements. You know, it's like the scene you were talking about where uh, with the drugs, where her, you know, the the scars on her arm become little mouths, you know? I mean, that's such a dream image Mm -hmm. that, you know, but it has that fantasy element of it as well, that surreal fantasy element. Um, and, And Freddy, where he's funny, but he's still dark and scary. Yeah. You know, and it's just before that that time period where they kind of maybe went a little bit too much into the funny, you mm-hmm. know, for, for my taste. Uh, but, you know, in, in, in three, he was still uh, really dark, really scary and really uh, but still had that that sardonic humor. That's, Chari- that's he's char- Robert England's charisma was always on point. With yes. Him. Yes. And you get the, the feeling that the jokes he's making are for his own benefit. Yes. You know, he's in <laughs> not, not us. Right. Yeah. And that that I think it really uh, strikes the, the, the perfect balance with Freddie in terms of the character, in my opinion. You know, just the, the idea of someone who's just enjoying what he does so much. And I always liked, I mean, even the things with his voice which they never really did in any of the others and after or before where they would modulate his voice differently in different scenes. You remember? Uh, Sometimes it would be very deep and sometimes it'd be more of a Robert England voice. And so it kind of had this weird, it kind of put you off balance a little bit with Freddie, you know, Mm because his voice kind of changed. Yeah. uh, Depending on who he was talking to and what the situation was. And I thought that was a neat little subtle touch that 
you could have maybe used uh, in future ones a little bit more, you know? And that, that's one thing I love about the Nightmare on Elm Street series that nobody really talks about. Yes, these movies are all connected, but if you watch these individually, they are their own movies. Like you said in this one, how you have that. And in Nightmare on Elm Street 2, how he gets into Jesse's body. You know, you got the brains, and or I got the brains, and you got the body. In Nightmare on Elm Street 4, how um, Alice has the ability to take everybody else's, you know, every time it's all part of the franchise, but they all could be their own standalone movies because of how different they all are. And they yeah. include different elements into each one. And I'm glad you brought that up because that's not something that really gets brought up a lot. And a Nightmare and on Elm Street 3 really did that with the voice as well as Freddy changing shapes into the worm, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. And something Nightmare on Elm Street 3 did that not a lot of people had the balls to do back then was they killed off their original final girl in it. You know, they killed Nancy in this movie. And that's not something you've seen a lot back then. Yeah, and that that's that takes balls, man. And that's mm-hmm. a good that's a great move too because everybody at that point is so invested in the Nancy character and the way the character is portrayed in that movie as the hero, the protector. You know, yeah. it, it's a perfect uh, uh, next step in terms of the character evolution from the first film in which she's trying to save herself. And then of course, in part three, she becomes the savior of other people, which mm-hmm. uh, obviously increased the stakes and makes her, it really rises, it brings her up to the level of, of you know, heroin in a way. You know? mm-hmm. And th- that's another thing. This movie has a bunch of great characters. I think this has the greatest cast of teens in any Nightmare franchise movie. Um, so we talked about the scene that affected you the most. We've talked about some of the other little things around that. What is your favorite scene? from this movie if you had to pick a favorite scene um i'm always a little bit fond well there are several actually i think it has one of the scary one it's a, it has one of the scariest openings i've ever i mean I, even now i think you know even like case hardened after years and years and years of exposure to horror films it's like when you get that opening and 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 uh patricia arquette is, is in the basement of that house and she's running and her feet get caught yes. and that slime and you see him coming down the hall and he's getting closer and closer and closer and she's trapped. That's a scary shot, man. That's, that's like the ultimate nightmare that you can't get away from this guy who's yeah. about to slash you with claws on his hands. You know I mean? It's like, yeah, I mean, that's terrifying. You know? yeah. And, and like then you said, the, you're just stuck. Like you're stuck in quicksand and he's coming and you can't do anything about it. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah, I and mean, even this the bit where you know Joey is trapped with the tongues over the fire, mm-hmm. you know, and of course me being kind of a, a slightly, I guess I'm getting a little older now, and coming from a generation that was before CGI, like I remember a lot of stuff before CGI was prevalent, and the magic that they used in creating those effects, you know, which sometimes was quite uncomfortable for the actor, but I'm sure but it was a physical effect and you just, it's hard to beat that, you know? Um, And a lot of the backstory behind part three, you know, with, you know, stuff they had to change because they thought it was too much. The, the scene I was talking about with Patricia Arquette, you know, where she looks down and the, the child is now a skeleton, but the skeleton does look a little dodgy, you know, but if you, if you ever look at like, I'm sure you've seen the actual, the first one that was made, Mm -hmm. it was like an emaciated, child it really looked realistic and they were like oh that looks too realistic so they went with this sort of skeleton thing you know uh i kind of wish they had used the original because the original is much more disturbing right Uh, well see i I grew up in a video store my parents owned a video store so this is you know watching horror movies is something we always did and bringing that up it's something that you should be able to i wish we could go back and get another version of that back here again like a director's cut that still has that because it's funny back then, like you said, that was huge. Nowadays, people wouldn't even bat an eye at something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could so get away with that and and more, you know. And mm-hmm. I mean, I, I do remember it, the controversy in in the eighties of uh, teen suicide too. And this movie deals with that head on. Yeah. And um, you know, that's pretty brave for the time because you're dealing with something that's very topical and very sensitive. Mm-hmm. And and this movie sort of goes there uh, yeah. because a lot of these kids are in the asylum because they attempted suicide. Uh, obviously driven by the, the nightmares that they're having and the experiences, mm-hmm. but that's another, uh, you know, that's another great thing that horror can do is you can deal with real life issues, serious stuff, 
but you can do it in a way that it's entertaining. Do you know what I mean? Yes. You know, yes. in a way that that's easily palatable for people. And I well, think and that for someone yeah. like, you know, someone that is going through something like that, that might feel suicidal could watch something like this and people say, Oh, well, that could push them, but it could also push them the other way. They can see that there's always a light. It, it always gets better. And this movie showcases that for the three main survivors of, uh, you know, Patricia Arquette, Kincaid and Joey. And yeah, your nightmares are going to be there, but you can always beat them. There's always a light at the end of that tunnel if you just hold on. Exactly. And and really what the, the movie is sort of saying is that there is uh, comfort in people who are like-minded, you know, because you mm -hmm. do have this, the teenagers and the authority figures, they just don't understand. Right. You know? But you have each other and in each other, you can find the strength to get past these things. Yep. And, uh, you know, and all you need sometimes is somebody like Nancy, you know, an, an understanding ear who's going to, you know, uh, pay attention and say, yeah, I understand what you're talking about. Even though all yeah, these other people are telling you, you know, you're crazy and all this stuff. I got you. I got you back. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, I mean, the film, it's, it's got uh, it's got a lot of heart to it. Oh, uh, yeah. And it still works in that gut punch horror you know, level. I mean, you don't get much more gut punch than using someone's uh, arteries as marionette strings. You know, I mean, that's 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 hardcore horror right there. And before I go on to the next question, something I love about that scene is how in some of the shots you see the arteries and in others you don't. You see him just walking. And I love I think it's masterful. They did that in the Nightmare on Elm Street with Tina's death, with her getting drug up the wall in the rotating room. You don't have to see Freddy for it to be scary. And sometimes it's scarier when you don't see him. Yeah, but because yeah, you, you're seeing like you're seeing what other people would see if they if they saw it, you know, and then you're seeing right. what this poor guy is going through, you know, which is a totally different uh, <laughs> <laughs> a much harsher ordeal. Exactly. And we talked about now your first horror movie being Nightmare 3. I want to ask, go a little bit curveball on you here. What's your favorite scary movie? What is your favorite scary movie? Favorite horror movie of all time? All right. Uh, I would say that probably my favorite would be The Exorcist. Uh, I, I love The Exorcist. I think that movie stands up on so many levels. Yeah. And um, it's just so well written, so well directed by William Friedkin, so well acted. I mean, you know, by all, everyone, there's not a clunker in that movie. There's not one bad right. performance, uh, including this, the small child who was just like, how did you have this kid pull that off? You know, Linda Blair. Linda Blair, man, she nailed it. And it's to the point where, I don't know if you've seen it, but on Shudder, they have a, uh, a segment called Cursed Films. Mm -hmm. And they do one on The Exorcist and they talk about, you know, her getting hurt when they were doing the bed thing and all the bad things that happened around the movie. And I'm with you. I don't think besides the, the original Blair Witch Project, there's been a horror movie that entranced the public the way that that did. You know, with the Blair Witch, everybody, I was in like eighth grade when that came out. And is this real? Did this really happen? Is it a snuff that, you know, we didn't know. And you didn't, you could just pull your phone out and Google things back then. Yeah. And the exorcist, when that came out, did the same thing. People were throwing up, crying, leaving the theater. They pulled, they even pulled the trailer off TV because Pazuzu was so scary. I mean, imagine a horror movie today having that effect on us to where we're pulling the trailer and women are crying and men are puking, running out of the theater. People, there was an uptick in the Catholic church. People were going back to church that hadn't been there because this movie had scared them. That's when you know you've done something right. When people have to go and let God know, <laughs> I need you because this movie scared yeah. me that bad. And do you remember like Billy Graham said that there was an actual demon living in the celluloid of the film? And I'm sure the whole time William Friedkin's like, oh yeah, free press. I love this. You can't buy this, you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I remember my mother uh, talking about it. She went to see that in the theater. Uh, the Exorcist obviously was a little bit before my time, but but she went to see it in the theater and she said that, you know, she made it through. So one of the harder scenes for her was where, where Reagan was getting the medical test, which is a lot of people's thing. Like when they can't sit through that when she's getting the tap in her neck and all that. And it's like, because it's so realistically portrayed, it almost looks yeah. like they really did the test to Linda Blair. I don't know. You know. I would hope they didn't, but you, no. with with William Friedkin, you just never know. You know, he might have. Um, but then, yeah, she was like, as soon as the head turned around, like, I, I, I gotta leave. So she didn't make it. She made it a long way. I was proud of her. That's, she, yeah, that's, a, that's a grip. 
Yeah. That, was... that movie affects you different when you're a kid. I have a, I have a, a son and two daughters now. And mm-hmm. as a parent watching this movie, I get scared for so many different reasons than I did when I was a kid. And that's the impact this movie has. You know, it scares you as a kid because you see a child, one of your peers going through something like this. And then as a parent, I see my daughter going through something like that and me being helpless to help her. And, yeah. you know, the, the feeling you have as a parent, and as a child, it's just so amazing how this movie can do that to you. Yeah, and that was the thing about that movie is it feels like this is something that's really happening somewhere. It has that mm-hmm. sense of, of realism. Yeah. Where even though it's something that, you know, uh, you know, demon possessing somebody, which is pretty out there, it feels like this is a real house on a real street and these are real people and they're actually going through this. And, you know, I mean, obviously they went off the rails with part two where it's like, I don't know what the hell they were thinking there. It's like nothing real. Part three about. is great. However, I just want to throw that out there. I no, I absolutely, I agree with you. I agree with you. Part three. Anytime you had William Peter Blatty involved, it was pretty, it was good. You know, Yeah. they always kind of strayed when they didn't have the original writer. I think mm-hmm. it was like, they didn't quite know how to balance that. Right. And we'll look at how they're still doing exorcism of an exorcist movies yeah. today. And that movie started that. There's so many ideas out there that would have never happened had it not been for The Exorcist. So I can agree with you. I think it's a top 10 horror film, hands down, every day. But we always do, my friend, end these with the same question. We end them with a skull count. We're going back to Night Round Elm Street 3. We're ranking it on overall quality, production, and how it affected you. Zero skulls being the worst. Five being the best. You can absolutely use half and quarter skulls. What would your skull count be for a Nightmare on Elm Street 3, The Dream Warriors? I would have to say a four and a half. And I'm going to take the half off because they used, they didn't use the emaciated kid. Kid, yeah. Yeah, you should have and used the emaciated kid you didn't, instead of the, the dodgy skeleton. <laughs> but that's that's it. That's the only thing. The four is perfect for me. That's what I would give it. There's only been one movie I've ever given a four and a half to. And that's the original Nightmare on Elm Street. If you take out the last three and a half minutes of that movie, that might be the not only perfect horror movie, but to me, most perfect movie ever made. I love Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, yeah. And you take out the blow up doll ending. <laughs> perfect movie. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking with the <laughs> blow up doll. Yeah. Well, um, don't go anywhere, my friend. I got a couple more questions for you. Everybody else, make sure, like I said, you're clicking the links down here in the description, showing LC some love. Check out that book. And he's going to have a novel hopefully coming out next year, like he said. Any updates he gives me, I'll give you. And if you follow him on social media, you won't have to wait for me. You'll get them for yourself. So, like always, my friends, stay what you are, keep talking horror, and we'll see you guys soon. 